You know, the very first service we had, I shed tears. I couldn't, I could barely talk when we didn't have a first service here on the Sunshine Coast. And just thinking about going, I, I really, you know, part of me doesn't want to go. And uh, as we we're singing, we're, we're channels only, aren't we? You know, we, we I've, I've been given a lot of gifts. I've been, I've been told many thanks and uh, some different things, you know, by the church, gift, gifts by different people. And I, I thank you for it. I thank you for it. But really, you know, I can only do it because of the Lord. You know, this, this church only exists because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just wanted to give him the glory. That's why this morning we just preach on salvation. Just reinforcing the fact that it's not us. It's a free gift. You know, it's, it's all because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of the love of the Father that we can be saved. And, and I was just thinking about, well, what do I want to conclude on? And normally we go chapter by chapter. The next chapter that I would have, uh, sorry, book by book. Uh, the next book and chapter that I would have covered in our study would be uh, Psalm 25. And I just read it through and I said, wow, what, what a great psalm. You know, it truly just lifts the Lord. It gives him the glory. Let's read verse number eight there again. Psalm 25, verse 8, Good and upright is the Lord. That's the total for the sermon this afternoon. Good and upright is the Lord. Amen. Is that what you think about the Lord God? That He is good. You know, even when you're going through difficulties and hardships, trials, that we can look at the Lord and say, well, He is good. He is upright. What does it mean to be upright? You know, we think of the word righteous and we know that God is without sin and that He's pure. You know, He, he, is, he is good. He, you know, God is love. You know, he is, he is perfection. There is nothing more holy than our Lord God. But the word upright has to do with standing up. You know, yes, yes, he's righteous, but he's upright. He's, he's uplifted. It means he stands out from the crowd. He stands out from every other God. He stands out from every other religion out there. You know, our, our resurrected Savior who gave his life for us. Hey, he's upright. He stands out. And so he deserves all our glory, all our worship, you know. And all we can do, brethren, is be clean channels that God can use for us. And what we see here is that, the, you know, David writes his psalm and, and he recognizes the righteousness of God and he wants to reflect God in himself as we'll look at this because his desire is to be righteous, to be upright as well, to reflect his Lord God. But as we look through this psalm, you know, David recognizes, I come short, I, I, I keep failing, I keep failing. And one thing that you notice in this, he keeps asking for God, can you forgive me? Because he looks at his frail state and he realizes I'm just a man, you know, and I cannot do these things without our Lord God. Let's start with verse number one, Psalm 25, verse one. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And of course, that has to do with prayer. Hey, is God good and upright? Yes. He allows us, which is but dust, which, which, which continue in sin. We struggle with his sinful flesh. He allows us to come before his throne and bring our prayers, our supplications before him. And that's hard to understand, but then you remember, yeah, but salvation made me a child of God. And I know as a father, I would, I would want nothing more than for my children to come to mom and dad when they're going through difficulties. When they need something, they should be coming to mom and dad, you know? And we have our Heavenly Father who allows us to lift up our soul to Him, even though we know we're not always upright, we're not always righteous. And so, yes, our Lord is good. Verse number two, Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. And then he says in verse number three, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. And so, you know, what he's identifying here is sometimes we can be ashamed you know, ashamed for our faith, ashamed for our, our faith in Jesus Christ, ashamed maybe even what the Bible says. You know, there's a lot of Christians that do not know what the Bible says. They, 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 yeah, they, there are parts they love and we ought to love the Bible, but there are parts that are hard to swallow. You know, it's sweet in our mouth like honey, but when he enters in, you know, the word of God can be bitter. It's challenging. It's hard. We look at our reflection. We know, boy, we, know, we don't meet up to the standards that God has. And how many times do we fail the Lord? And, and sometimes we can be embarrassed for standing up for what the Bible says. And, and so the psalmist is saying, oh, look, I don't want to be ashamed. Don't let us be ashamed. But let, let, the, let the transgressors, let the wicked, let the sinners be ashamed for the way they live. And we live in a strange environment these days where people can openly sin, people can openly just go for their abortions and kill their babies and commit all manners of wickedness and they have no shame. You know, our nation has lost the fear of God. This ought to be our, be our prayer like the psalmist and say, God, bring shame upon these wicked people. You know, let them have a fear of you. Let them understand that they're not right with you and they need Jesus Christ as Savior. 
You know, we can't puff ourselves up because we were once there, weren't we? We were once that person that was wicked, that, was, that, you know, that maybe had no shame for our sins, but we've learnt the truth, we've heard the gospel, somebody preached that precious word to us, and we've placed our faith on Jesus Christ. You know, and so he's asking the Lord, you know, help me to not be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. I want you to think about that, you know. If you want to be a Christian that's not ashamed for Jesus Christ, you have to wait on the Lord. You have to be patient. You know, the Christian life isn't this, this uh, ultra fast run. It's a marathon. It takes time. You need patience. Work on it day by day. There are many Christians that are in church one day. They're gone the next because they don't understand. It's a marathon. You know, it, it, you, you need to be patient in your, as you run the race for our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just read to you from Romans 5, chapter, uh, Romans 5 verse 3. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. If we're called to wait on the Lord, we're required to have patience. And you know what? God may allow tribulation, trials in your life, okay? When you're going through difficulties, don't turn around and say, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? You know, don't get upset with God when you're, when you're having trials and difficulties. Just say, well, Lord, you've allowed me to go through this trial. You must be working patience in me. This is something that I must need in my life. It keeps going. It says uh, in verse number uh, four, and patience, experience. So patience brings experience and experience hope. And then verse number five says, and hope maketh not ashamed. You know what? If you have hope in God, you will not be ashamed for his word. You will not be ashamed for standing up for Jesus Christ. It says because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. What is it to have hope? What does it mean to have hope in something? It means you have confidence. You have trust in God. You have trust in the Bible. The more you know this word, the more you realize this is the truth of God's word. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow, but it is truth. You're not going to find any greater truth in this world except in this book. The more you know this book, the more time you spend patiently reading, learning about God, spending time with God, you know, going through difficulties and trials and seeing how God will mold you and change you, you will grow in experience, you will grow in hope, and you will not be ashamed for the Lord God. It takes time. It takes time to develop. It takes time to grow and not be ashamed. Look at verse number four in Psalm 25, verse four. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Why else is our Lord a good and upright Lord? Because he's willing to teach us. Right? He's willing to show us His ways, to teach us His paths. I don't know if you've ever spent time... I've trained a lot of people on the job. I don't know if you guys have learned to train people. You know what you need to train people? A lot of patience. A lot of patience. You know, and I've seen fellow uh, you know, people in my workplace give up on training. It's like, oh, this person just doesn't get it. Well, then it's your job to make him get it. It's your job to teach them. It's your job to understand why they're not getting it and change your approach, maybe. Yeah. Not everybody learns the same way. And so what do we learn about God then? He wants us to learn His ways, does He not? Hey, we serve a patient God. I am praise God for a patient God. This is why you know the doctrines you know. This is why you're growing and maturing in the Lord because He's being patient with you. Hey, how about you be patient with God? How about you wait with God because He's being patient with you, okay? He's guiding you. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Hey, you want God to be your teacher, to be your guide? Well, everywhere you go, acknowledge God. Acknowledge God. Hey, we're celebrating three years, New Life Baptist Church, we acknowledge God. We thank God for what He's been able to do here on the Sunshine Coast. We thank God for the members He's added to this church. We thank God for the souls that are getting saved in the ministry. Okay? We give Him thanks. We acknowledge God. Verse number uh, 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. So again, the patience, the waiting. Teach me, Lord. You're the God of my salvation. You can see the heart of David there, right? He's appreciated for his salvation. He says, Lord, teach me more. You know, thank you for salvation. I want to know you more. I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time in your word. He said, lead me in thy truth. And again, I spoke to you about the Bible. 
Brethren, please never let a day go past without picking up this book and reading it. Even if it's just a verse. Please, just, just it, look, if, if you've gone a day, you've gone a day, and it happens to everybody, you forgot to pick up the Bible, you forgot to read it, and you're about to go to bed, just, just pick up, just do one verse. Just one verse. It, there's power in God's Word. You know, it, it can lead, that one verse can change your life. You know, it might very well be what the Lord is leading you to understand. You know what John, uh, Jesus said in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them, speaking of his disciples, through thy truth, thy word is truth. And then he says this, it's uh, a little bit strange. It says in verse number 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. You know why you're here, brethren? Jesus has sent you in this world. You got saved. As I said before, hey, you got saved, you're on your way to heaven. Yeah, God could take you to heaven. We saw with Enoch. Enoch was translated, right? God can take you to heaven if he so desires. But Jesus has left you here. He's sending you into this world to teach the truth of God's word. And then it says in verse number 19, Jesus' words, he says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. That's strange. Why does Jesus have to sanctify himself? Isn't he already pure? Isn't he already holy? Yeah, of course he is. Okay? Jesus needs no further sanctification. But don't forget, Jesus Christ came to set an example for us. And so when he's speaking about himself sanctifying himself, he's saying, I'm different from this world. I'm different from the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of heaven. You know, uh, you know, my, my, uh, you know I, I represent uh, the Father. I'm doing the works of the Father. I, I'm preaching the words of the Father. I, I'm doing what the Father has asked me to do. You know, I, I'm submitting my will to the Father. This is how Jesus Christ came to be an example of sanctification. And in the same way that he stood out, that he was sanctified, that he was holy and separate, he wants that the same from you, from you and I. And how are we sanctified? Thy word. Thy word. The word of God is what sanctifies us. Brethren, if you go days upon days, weeks upon weeks, months upon months, without reading this Bible, without being challenged by his word, you're going to either stunt your growth, or you're going to go back to the same way you used to be before. You need God's word. It is our daily food. It is our spiritual food for this life that we're trying to live, right? To serve our Lord Jesus. Verse number six. Psalm 25, verse 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. And of course, this is why God is a forgiving God, because of his tender mercies, because of his loving kindness, because of his patience. Thank God, otherwise we would have been wiped out, if not for his mercy. Okay? And so the psalmist is saying, look, can you remember your mercies? What do you think, what do you think the psalmist is saying this? Oh, well, I'll show you soon. Look at verse number 7. He says, remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. See, as he's praising the Lord, as he's giving God thanks, as he's asking the Lord to direct him and guide him, he's come to realize, oh man, I've messed up again. I've got those transgressions again. And he's asking, Lord, remember your mercies? I need them again. <laughs> I need your loving kindness again. This is why I encourage you, brethren, keep a short account with God in your daily walk. Go and confess your sins. You know, go and make things right so that you're not far from the Lord in, in your daily life. Go and confess your sins. You're going to notice that as you get closer to the Lord, as you learn His ways, the more you realize how, for, how far you are from the Word of God. Right? And then the psalmist says, oh man, I've transgressed. Right? And he's asking the Lord to remember uh, his goodness. Now, one thing that's interesting about verse number 7, he says, remember not the sins of my youth. Now, you would think, you know, King, King David now, you know, as a man, you, you, I mean, of course, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, he's paid for all of our sins. You know, all our sins have been forgiven. You know, and, and even uh, as we confess our sins, those sins are forgotten by the Lord. I'll just read some passages to you. You can go to Psalm 103. Go to Psalm 103. You're not far from there. Go to Psalm 103, verse number 12. Psalm 103, verse number 12. The Bible reads, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, they're gone. Okay, those the east will not meet uh, east, right? They're not going to meet each other. I'll just read another passage, Jeremiah 31, 34. It says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. 
Boy, when God forgives us, He says, I'm going to forget. I'm not going to remember anymore. I'm not going to bring it back to my remembrance. That's where we fail as Christians, as, as people. You know, we might wrong one another, and I say, I forgive you, but then it's kind of, we bring it back, don't we? We, we bring back, and it's, if someone wrongs you again, we bring back the past faults that they've done in the past. That's not how God is. When God forgives us, He forgets about it. He doesn't want to remember it anymore. It's gone, all right? Another passage, Isaiah 43, verse 25. God says, I, even I, am He that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Oh man, praise God. Okay, because could, could God decide to remember our sins? He's all knowing, okay, but He chooses to not remember. He chooses to forget those sins. And so when we go to the Lord and, and we confess our sins on a regular basis in our, in our walk, right, in our daily walk with Him, well, those sins that we've done in our youth, the sins that we've done in our past, not only are they forgiven, they're forgotten. You know, if you keep bringing up, up to God, oh God, I'm sorry for those sins I did back then. God's like, well, what sins? I forgot about those. I don't bring them to my remembrance. And so what do we notice here? We notice the difference between the psalmist and God, God who forgets, but the psalmist is still haunted by some of the sins in his past. Okay? And so this is one of the difficulties that we have where we, we can uh, appreciate that God has forgiven us, but we often forget to forgive ourselves. We often forget to say, well, that's in the past. I made some mistakes. Uh, you know, I've really messed up. But, you know, even Paul says he's the chief of sinners. And, and we've all committed grave sins that we regret. We, we all uh, maybe have, uh, uh, you know, consequences and, and things that we're still challenged with because of past mistakes. But listen, you're not more righteous than God. If God, who is perfect, upright, and righteous, is able to forgive those sins, then you need to learn to forgive yourself as well. If you keep going back, you're not going to be able to move on and do great things for God. You're going to be stuck in those old past sins, the sins of my youth. Listen, I, I, I know that struggle. We all struggle with that. But you need to learn and understand God's forgotten about them. They're done. It's all, it's all been washed in the blood. God doesn't even have it in His mind anymore. You have to learn to forgive yourself. If God can forgive you, surely you can forgive yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, you won't be able to move on with your life okay, and do greater things for the Lord. Let's look at verse number 8 now, Psalm 25, verse 8. This is where we got the title for the sermon for this afternoon. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will He teach sinners in the way. Wow, He wants to teach sinners. What's a, what's a sinner? Someone who breaks the law of God. You know, while you're a sinner, while you're breaking God's laws, God still wants to take your side and teach you. Even when you offend His laws, offend God, He's still so loving, so good and upright that He wants to take you under His wing and teach you and guide you and, and help you to have victory over those sins. What an amazing God that we serve. Because if you were offending me, I don't want to really help you. I mean, I'm just talking like a man, right? I'm just like, God, just leave me alone, I'd be thinking, right? But God's like, no, I'm going to take you. I'm going to teach you. And so when we get this idea of good and upright is the Lord, there's two ways that we can understand, understand this. Number one, in the sense that He is the only one that can teach what is good and upright. If, if God is good and upright, then He is the only one that is truly, you know, good and upright 100% of the time. So He's the only one that can teach us how to walk in His ways. That's one way to understand it. But the other way to understand this is that He is good and upright because He's willing to teach sinners. Okay, because the average person, if you kept offending me, I'd be like, I don't, go away. I don't want anything to do with you. I mean, honestly, it just, if you keep, I, I know I'm commanded to forgive you, you know, uh, time and time again, right? I'm commanded to forgive you, but just that, that part of, of your natural man and makeup will be like, I'm kind of done with you. Whereas God says, no, I'm so good and upright, I'm still willing to work with you, even as a sinner. And it, this reminds me of Jesus Christ when he was walking this earth in Luke 15, verse 1. I'll just read it to you. It says, Then drew near unto him, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Brethren, did you know Jesus allowed the publicans, you know, the government workers, the tax collectors, those that were cheating the people of those days and sinners to come and listen to Jesus? So how should we be in this church? If we see somebody come in here all tattooed up, some man with long hair, right, some guy that's just, you know, spewing filthy things, he, you know, he can't control his, his you know, cuss-speaking mouth, you know, that's a sinner. You know, we don't want to drive people away from the church. Even Jesus was willing to work with a sinner. Even Jesus was willing to preach to a sinner. 
You know, we can't just have this, you know, I, I, you know our dress standard keeps getting better. It seems like every time it looks like it just things get better and better. Praise God. But we don't want to get to the point where we think, oh, we're the righteous ones. We're the right ones. And everyone else out there, hey, it's, it's taken us time to get to where we are. We need to give other people the same amount of time. Okay, God's worked in us. We ought to be able to willing, be willing to help them. And so in Luke 15 verse 2, it says, And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And eateth with them. Okay, so Jesus was willing to hang around some sinners. Okay, not to be influenced by, by them. All right, he wasn't going out there, you know, to the pub and drinking it up with a bunch of sinners. Like a lot of that's being taught in some churches these days. You know, no. You know, he was willing to, hey, this sinner is willing to listen to the word of God. They're willing to learn, I'm going to spend time with that person. I don't care what the scribes and Pharisees say. Okay? We don't want to be a church that turns into Pharisees and scribes. Oh, we're so holy. We're so right. No, you're not. Okay? You're only righteous because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed upon you. Okay? Don't forget that from this morning's sermon. Let's keep going. Verse number 9. The meek... He will guide in judgments, and the meek he will teach his way. So if we want to be, if we want to learn from God, what attitude should we have toward God? What did it say there? The meek he will guide in judgment. The meek he will teach his way. You can learn, you can grow if you decide to be meek. What does it mean to be meek? To be lowly. Say, well, Lord, I don't know better than you. Okay, I, I, I'm willing to, to say, you know what, Lord, I, I'm willing to be proven wrong. If, if you can show me in your word, you're willing to work in me, Lord, I'm willing to, to be shown where I'm wrong. I'm willing to change these things about me. I'm willing to be lowly and meek. Then God can teach you great truths. Okay, that's the attitude. In fact, that's how you get saved. You've got to get to the point where you're just meek and say, Lord, you're right. It's not of me. It's of Jesus. And you give Jesus the glory. You put your faith and trust on Him. That's how you get saved. Well, that's how you continue to learn and grow. By remaining meek. By remaining humble. When you listen to preaching of God's Word, if it, if it upsets you, hey, just take the decision. I'm going to meek. I'm going to be meek. If it's coming from God's Word, I'm willing to learn because that's how God can teach you. The Bible tells us in James 4, 6, But it giveth more grace, whereof you say, If God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble give of grace to the humble. We need to be meek and humble in order for the Lord God to teach us. Look at verse number 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His uh, covenant and His testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. So this is the second time that the psalmist is ashamed for his sins. Did you notice that? He's asking the Lord, can you pardon my iniquities? Listen, it, this is uh, the first time he actually asked to be pardoned, to be forgiven. Again, he gets, uh, as, as he's writing this psalm, again, he just says, oh man, I, again, I need to go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. Because he realizes as he's learning, uh, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, sorry, I'll read it again, verse number 10. All the pastor of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. So as the psalmist learns more about the covenant that God's put with man, and of course now we're in the new covenant days, right? And he knows the, 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 the commandments and the testimonies that God has asked from his people. As, as he learns more about God's word, he realizes once again, oh man, I'm a sinner. That's how it should be. You know, I, I don't remember my, you know, when I got saved so much, you know, because I was four years old. I don't really remember it. But I remember Christina. I remember Christina when she got saved. She was willing to admit she was a sinner. She was willing to admit that the Roman Catholic Jesus was not the true Jesus of the Bible and she needed the true Jesus of the Bible to save her. And, you know, she recognized she had some sins. But I always remember she would call me up and say, did you know that is a sin? Did you know that is a sin? The more she would read the Bible, the more she would hear preaching. She said, oh man, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. That's a sin as well. That's a sin as well. She, the more you know the Bible, the more you realize how much of a sinner you truly are. And so that's what I think this, uh, this is happening to the psalmist. He, he's spending time in the testimonies of God. It's, oh man, I need, I need God to forgive me. Because that was a sin as well. I better get that sorted out with God. And so you can see how the, how the psalmist wants to give God praise. He wants to lift the Lord. He wants to lift the word of God. But every time he does, he realizes, oh man, I'm a sinner. I've transgressed against the Lord. And that is the right and proper place. You know, uh, the, the more we learn about God, the more holy we understand Him to be. The more pure, the more good we know God, the more we realize, just like value our salvation. Value that He loved us so much to give Jesus Christ as a sacrifice. 
Verse number 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And so once again, not only should we be meek to learn, but we see here we need to be someone that fears the Lord. If you do not fear the Lord, you cannot learn the ways of God. You cannot learn the Bible. You cannot learn how God wants to direct your paths if you do not have a fear of God. Can you go to, uh, keep your finger there, go to Psalm 111. Go to Psalm 111. And while you're turning there, I'll just read to you from Proverbs 1, 7, which says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let me read. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible says. In Proverbs 9, 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now you're in Psalm 111. Look at verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There it is once again. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever. So brethren, you want to learn the way of God? You want to learn the Bible? You want to know the deeper truths? You've got to have a fear of God. You know, you've got to understand that God is holy and we have come short. We need to understand that, you know, in our daily walk, we will never truly represent you know, God's holiness, that we're going to make mistakes. And just humble yourself and, and be willing to admit that. Be willing to confess your sins. Say, God, I have a fear of you. If you have a fear of God, you're going to fear His chastisement. Say, God, I don't, I don't want that chastisement. Please give me your mercy. Give me your loving kindness. Please be patient with me, Lord, as I learn your ways. That's the kind of heart that God is looking for. Someone that can fear Him. Someone that is lowly. He'll teach you His ways. It's not just doctrine and knowledge. It's, it's knowledge to live out your life. A life of joy, a life of maturity, a life that, you know, is not destroyed by your lack of knowledge. You know, God gives us so many precious truths. If only this world knew how precious God's truth was, they would save themselves from so many disasters. Look at uh, verse number 13. Psalm 25, verse 13. It says, he, his soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. His seed shall inherit the earth. You know, God has promised us that we will inherit this earth. You know, Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. You know, the best we can do, brethren, is just preach the gospel, you know, plant the seeds, let the Lord do His work. Let the Holy Ghost do His work. You can't force anybody to get saved. You can't force anybody to believe. But what you can do is just do the Great Commission. Do what God has asked us to do. Preach the gospel. You know, uh, be bold with your presentation. Let people know that they need Jesus Christ. The rest of it is up to the Lord. You know, the rest of it is up to that person that is, is hearing His word. And so we're never going to get to this point that we just Christianize the world. There are some Christians that think that. That we're going to get to the point where all the nations are going to become uh, believers of Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. In fact, things are going to wax worse and worse, the Bible tells us. Okay? I'm not living for this world. But Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. He's going to set up His kingdom, His kingdom for a thousand years. And we're going to rule and reign with Him. You know, He's going to allow us to have positions of authority, positions of servitude for Him, and we're going to inherit this earth. So it's going to be great for a thousand years inheriting this old earth. Yes, it's going to fix things up a little bit, but don't forget, the one we're looking forward to, forward to the, the most is the new heaven, the new earth. Okay? And we're going to inherit that new heaven, that new earth that never had the curse of God that would fall upon it and never will. And so we have this great future, this great eternal promise that we will be with the Lord God forever. We're going to inherit that earth. Now look at verse number 14. The secrets of the Lord. Do you guys want to know secrets? God has secrets in His Bible. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. And He will show them His covenant. You know there are, there are truths in the Bible that are secrets to this world. But God wants you to know them. God wants you to know His secrets. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 34, it says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake He not unto them, 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Brethren, we can have the secrets of God. Things that have been kept secret from the foundation. We know of Jesus Christ. We have the New Testament to share light, uh, shed light on the Old Testament to understand what these prophets of old were writing about. We know so many things, brethren. We know the great truth of eternal life. What an amazing thing. You know, this world is constantly trying to prolong their life. They want some type of eternal life. We have it. We have the secrets. And now it's up to us to go and proclaim that secret, right? Proclaim the secret knowledge that we have in the Bible. This is why Jesus Christ came speaking in parables. You know, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that will uh, uh, show us and teach us the doctrines of God. Okay? There are some things that have been kept secret from this world. Can you please keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. Oh, ch chapter 2, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Let's just think about this passage right now. It says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit knows the things of God. Absolutely, right? Look at verse number 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Wow. So his secrets, his knowledge is given to us freely. God wants you to have his knowledge. If you've been saved, you've been born of the Spirit, and not only that, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will teach us all things. You know, I've got a, a, a friend of mine who's, I don't know if his mother is saved, but his mother, one of, his, one of the mother's arguments against Christianity, I suppose, is like, well, you all read from the same Bible, but why do you all churches do things differently? Why do you all have different beliefs? Why? Because they do not have the Holy Spirit of God to direct them in truth. You, brethren, as saved people, have a special privilege, a Spirit of God indwelling in you. And through His Holy Spirit, by the reading of His Word, He's going to show you His secrets freely, freely given to us to learn. What a shame to leave this Bible on the shelf and not pick it up. Right. When we have the Holy Ghost to reveal great truths, great spiritual truths in His Word. Then it says in number, verse number 13, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Who teaches you, brethren? The Holy Ghost teaches you, okay? Now, is the Holy Ghost going to give you some direction that's different from this Word? No. This is how you know whether it's from the world, the Spirit of the world, or the Spirit of God. Okay, you learn some truth. Something's come to you. Some understanding has come to you. What do you do with that understanding? Do you just go and proclaim it? Oh, God's told me some great truth. Do you go and proclaim it? No, you compare spiritual with spiritual. You have some truth. Now you take what is the most spiritual thing that you've got in your hands, the Word of God. Say, well, Lord, I believe this to be true. I'm going to compare spiritual with spiritual. Does this line up in the Bible? Hey, that is cons oh, it's consistent. Hey, this is what God says. You know then that the Holy Ghost revealed some great truth to you. Praise God for that. But if you come with some truth, some, something that you thought was from the Holy Spirit of God, you come to the Bible, it's contradictive. It's not, no, that, that's that verse doesn't say that. God never spoke about that topic and you just come with that idea. Well, now you learn that's, that's from the spirit of the world. So the last thing you want to do is go around proclaiming, God's revealed some great truth to me. This happens to a lot of Pentecostal churches. Oh, God's revealed something to me. I have a word of knowledge. But it's not, it's not compatible with the Bible. It's not been compared to spiritual things. Okay, then you know it's not of God. Then don't talk about it. It's, if it's not of God, if, it's not, if you can't see it in the Word of God, it's not His Word. It's from the Spirit of this world. You have to be careful of what you teach and proclaim. The reason we come to this church and, and the preaching is filled with Scripture is because I don't want to preach something that is the wisdom of man. I want to make sure that it's the wisdom of God, it's the Spirit of God that is speaking to the people of God. 
Verse number 15, back in our Psalm 25 now. Psalm 25, verse 15. The psalmist says, Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for He shall pluck my feet out of the net. So I suppose here we have some enemies that maybe got the better of him, okay, and he's been caught in their nets. You know, we can't expect to go life without getting some damage. You know, sometimes our enemies will prevail. Sometimes we will fall in the trap of our enemies. But if our eyes are toward the Lord, then we can have the confidence that he's going to pluck our feet out of that net, out of that net. Now, let's look at verse number 16, because I really like verse 16, 17, and 18. Sometimes when we go through trials and difficulties, we like to blame other people. You know, I, I know somebody that always blames the devil. They do something wrong, they commit some sin, oh, the devil made me do it. It was the devil. The devil put that in my mind. Maybe. It, it can happen. It can happen. But I like how the psalmist says, what he, what he says here in verse number 16, he says, Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, so he's going, to go to, he's going to confess his sins to the Lord again. You'll see this. For I am desolate and afflicted. So he's suffering. He's desolate. He's alone. He's afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Things are getting worse and worse. It seems like when you go for a problem, you know, another problem comes, another problem comes. All of a sudden you're dealing with like four or five problems. Why have they come all at once? The problems have enlarged. The troubles have enlarged. He says, oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain. His suffering is going through difficulties. But then he says this, and forgive all my sins. What's he saying? What the psalmist is saying, brethren, he's not blaming the devil. He's not blaming the world. He's saying, look, the reason I'm, being, I'm desolate, the, the reason I'm afflicted, the reason the problems have enlarged itself, the reason I'm in pain is because I've sinned. Many times our trials and our difficulties are because of our own sin. The lust in our own hearts that come out, we commit sin, we get into problems, and yeah, you know, the pride in us will like to blame someone else. Oh, it was my friends. It was the devil. It was the world. No, it's come from your heart. The psalmist is willing to admit, I'm going through these problems. And he's like, oh man, God, forgive my sins. <laughs> he realizes it's my sin. I've messed up. I've gotten myself in these problems. And so, brethren, please be mindful of this. If you're going through difficulties and trials and pains and, and, and you want to figure out where is this coming from, sometimes just look inwardly a little bit. Maybe you've done it. Maybe you've been a cause of that problem. Maybe you're the cause of that conflict with a brother or sister in the Lord or whatever. Okay? And it's all fallen upon you and it's because of your sins. All you can do, like the psalmist does, God, forgive my sins. I've messed up. He's willing to admit that, right? Rather than just blame some other external force. And so, if you can uh, keep your finger there, let's go, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 now. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. I just want to remind you, who are our enemies in this world? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 2. The Christian does have three main enemies in this world. Okay? And as I said, there are some that will blame the devil. And yes, the devil does, you know, he's the tempter. You know, he can cause us to disobey and, and he'll bring things into your life. But there's only one devil. I know he has other devils. Okay, I don't think you're that important that the devil, Satan himself, is after you every single day. Okay, he can't be all places at once. All right, he's probably somewhere else where he feels he can cause more damage, right? But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world. So the first enemy that we see there, brethren, is the course of this world or worldliness. You know, the way the world wants you to live, that is an enemy. You know, usually it's an un the, the way they want you to live, the, the system in this world is an ungodly system. This is why they pass laws. They don't care uh, about, you know, uh, uh, offending God. And it seems like as, as our nation and, and nations around this world continue to pass laws, it's like they open the Bible and see what God wants them to do and just do the opposite. So look, there's the course of this world. That is an enemy. But then it says, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So yeah, two enemies listed in verse number two. The world and Satan, right? Look at verse number three. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. 
There's your third enemy, the lusts of your flesh. Okay? It says here, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And as so, as I was saying to you, brethren, if you're going through difficulties, don't just jump. Oh, it's the devil. Oh, I mean, I'm having sickness. It's, it's, of the, it's of the devil. Oh, I'm having problems. Oh, the world's caused all these problems. It might be the lust of your own flesh. Instead of blaming others, just look inwardly, like I said. Just realize the mistakes you've done. Go to the Lord. Confess them. Lord, help me. Help me in my distresses. I've done this to myself. And if you can say, no, you know, I've been keeping a clean account with God. I'm living righteously. I'm trying to serve the Lord. Yeah, then maybe some of those pains and difficulties and trials you're going through can be outward factors. Okay, but don't jump the gun immediately blaming someone else most likely a lot of that has come from the flesh okay unfortunately this is the flesh that we have to live with until we can receive our new resurrected bodies which we won't have those temptations we won't ever sin in those new bodies that god will give us all right let's uh look back at verse number 19 now psalm 25 verse 19 It says, Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. The Christian life, you're going to have enemies. As I said, those enemies, the world, Satan, the flesh. But we could have just the average human being, the average man, maybe even someone in your own family that set themselves up as an enemy. You know, Be mindful of this, because the world cannot receive the Bible, cannot receive the truth of God's Word. And when you stand for it, you are going to create enemies. You're going to have enemies. You know, my inbox is full of enemies. My, my email is full of enemies. Okay? They're, they're there. All right? It's just part of the, the Christian life. But he asks the Lord, look, please deliver me. Consider my enemies. Think about my enemies for a moment, Lord. Look at them. He has the trust, the hope that God's going to step in and take care of that situation. And again, why do we go through some of these difficulties and hardships? So the Lord can refine us, okay? So that He can purify us. So He can teach us patience. So He can teach us how to hope and not be ashamed of His Word. Look at verse number 20. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed. There it is again. For I put my trust in Thee. Now, I love verse number 21 because we started with the idea that God is upright, okay? And the psalmist says, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. So the psalmist started by saying, God, you are upright. You know, you are good and upright. And now he says, look, I want to be the same way. You know, I want to be someone of integrity and uprightness. I don't want to be just someone that is righteous. I don't want to be just someone that, that, that uh, you, know, uh, you know, cleans up their life of sin, but I want to stand up. I want to stand out in the crowd. I want to be someone that is known as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so he desires to be upright. But notice, integrity and uprightness. These are two characteristics that we need to put into our lives. What is integrity? Integrity comes from the word integer. It's a mathematical term, right? What is an integer? Another way of saying integer is a whole number. For those that are home doing school, what's a whole number? A number that is without a decimal, that's not fraction, right? A whole number, to be whole, okay? To be consistent as it is, okay? So integrity is someone, you come to church, you come with your Bibles, you come loving the Lord, you come serving the Lord. Hey, but if tomorrow you don't read your Bible, if tomorrow you don't give thanks to God, if tomorrow you're not praising God on a Monday, hey, that's not integrity. You're not whole. You're inconsistent, Okay, integrity means I'm consistent on Sunday at church, on Monday I'm still serving God, on Tuesday I'm still picking up my Bible, on Wednesday I'm still coming uh, to the prayer meeting at church, on Thursday I'm still serving the Lord, on Friday it's the end of the week, I'm still working hard because the Lord is my employer. Whatever it is, brethren, integrity means that you keep your focus on the Lord and you remain consistent in your service to Him. Whatever position God has put you in, that's integrity. And then uprightness, as I said, standing upright. Not just being righteous, but standing upright. Uprightness, right? Standing out from the crowd. And if you are living out the the laws that God has put us in our our word, uh, in the word, sorry, you will stand out from the crowd. You will be different. People will say there's something unusual about you. Whether they mean that is a good or bad thing, doesn't really matter. As long as you're standing up for God, that's what matters, 
okay? But your integrity, your uprightness, that's what's going to preserve you, in verse number 21, during the times of difficulties, okay? If you're failing, if you're not finding victory in hardships, you might need to look at your integrity. You might need to look at your uprightness. Are you standing out from the crowd? Are you living for the Lord? And we'll finish up on verse number 22 there. It says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. And so what I like about the psalmist, yes, he's focused on himself, but he also wants the righteousness for his nation. Okay, he, you know, he's the king of Israel, and he wants to be right with God, and he wants to make sure that his nation is right with God. Oh, how I wish that Australia was right with God. Oh, how I wish this nation had a fear of God. That people were back in church on Sundays. You know, people were back out knocking doors, preaching the gospel, seeing people saved. And uh, I don't know if that's going to happen for our nation. But as I've taught you, brethren, this is just a temporary nation that we live in. You know, we're just passing through. We're just sojourners. We're just strangers and pilgrims on this earth. And we do belong to a nation, though. Of course, that's the nation, the Israel of God. Galatians 6.14, I'll just read it to you. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I'm crucified to the world, he says. You know, I'm not of this world. But then he says in verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Look, the circumcision represents uh, the, the Jews, right? And, and he says, look, that doesn't profit you anything. The Israel of God is not just some circumcision. It's not just some DNA. He says in verse number 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. According to what rule? That we glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Hey, that nation in the Middle East, they do not glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. That is not the Israel of God. The Israel of God is the one that glories in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so when the psalmist ends by saying, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles, then my thought turns immediately to the people of God. In the New Testament, the church, the people of God that are the Israel of God, you know what? I want out that spiritual nation, the people of God, to find deliverance in their trouble, to find deliverance in their hardship. Brethren, what an amazing thing that we serve a God that is good, a God that is upright, a God that loves us, that gave us Jesus. He gives us His Word. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And He wants us to just have that integrity. He wants us to reflect Christ in our lives, to be upright the way that God is upright. So, brethren, you know, I just wanted to finish up with this. We give God the glory. He is good. He is so good. He's given us so much. And we still haven't yet experienced the fullness of His goodness. And until we get home in heaven, boy, it's going to be an exciting time. Exciting time. And I'm so thankful that, you know, I get to spend time with you guys here on this earth. But hey, for all eternity, we're going to be hanging around each other. We're going to, we're going to spend time together for all eternity, enjoying the goodness of God in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.